Good morning. Um, my name is Ellen Pierce. I just wanted to, before I introduce the speakers this morning, and we only have an hour for the speakers, I um, wanted to say a few words. Um, on behalf of the advisory committee and all of us gathered here, I would like to personally thank Father William P. Leahy, the president of Boston College, for his interest and generosity in making this critical conference possible. Since our first initial meeting with Father Leahy, he has been a passionate advocate for the preservation of Catholic religious archives. And without his commitment to this conference, we would not have been able to assemble here today. So I want to thank Father Leahy and thank all of you for your participation. Give yourselves a hand. So I'm going to introduce the three speakers um, and then they'll be up here to, to uh, give their talks. Um, first is Emily Lee Loomis. Um, she is a certified archivist and records manager. She is the director of the archives of the um, Archdiocese of New Orleans and curator of the old Ursuline Convent Museum. Dr. Loomis holds leadership positions in uh, national and international archives organizations, including chairing the section for relig I'm sorry, the section for archives of faith-based traditions for the ICA, which is the International Council on Archives. Her publications include many. I'm not going to read them all. So that's Lee. And next we have um, Kate Kat, Kat Oosterhoos. Um, and she is the director of the Mercy Heritage Center uh, since February of 2016. Located in Belmont, North Carolina, the center serves as a central repository for the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas. And Kate, previous, Kat, I'm sorry, Kat. Her name is Kat, or I'll say Catherine. Um, she previously worked as an archivist at the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm sure that has nothing to do with mint leaves. Okay, and lastly we have David Horn. Um, who retired in 2017, right after I did. Um, not from, I did not retire from Boston College, but um, David retired from the Burns Library at Boston College. And for many years, he taught the introductory archives workshops for the Society of American Archivists. He graduated from St. Anselm's College and holds an MA in history from Boston College and an MLS from the University of Oregon. So welcome our speakers. Kate, you're first. There's a really bright light and I'm also a walker as I talk, and I need to see my slides. This is my TED talk. I don't have a lavalier or anything. but um, And I noticed right off, for all of us that write and um, try not to make mistakes, that I have a mistake in my first slide. There should not be a capital T. We are not the diocese. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about how we can partner with a diocese. And this is the, what I want to cover very briefly in 15 minutes or less, and that is the, um, how the Archdiocese of New Orleans has partnered with many of our communities 
Um, I'm going to talk about the role of the archivist as the diocesan archivist and how that person can be an expert to you and be someone that you can liaise with to get some information from. And then I'm going to talk about some of the options. The one option you have in front of you, we can go over in detail if we have time. If not, it is for you to be able to um, pilfer from in all of its glory. It has gone through our general counsel. It is a document that we use um, when we do a trust and care agreement, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So in the Archdiocese of New Orleans, um, we've started partnering more than 20 years ago with our different religious communities in the area. And one of the things we did in 1994 was to provide microfilming for their most pertinent collections, their historical records that they felt were primary, foundation records, etc. It did not make them accessible to anyone in the archdiocese. What it did was we were then the disaster recovery copy. We took that on as part of our own mission um, part of it was funded by the Archdiocese. The other part was funded by the religious community as well. So if they could afford it and were willing to partner with us, then we provided the service because we had the expertise to be able to go out because we routinely sent documents to be microfilmed so that we had our backup. So it was really easy for us to sort of say, hey, would you like to do this too? We'll help you. So we d we've done it with the Earth's Lines. We have over 20 rolls of film with them, the Sisters of the Holy Family, the Dominicans, etc. In 1995, the Mount Carmel um, Monastery flooded, so we were there to help them. We partnered with ARMA, which is the Association of Religious, excuse me, listen, religious, the <laughs> records managers um, and administrators, and they helped as well to fund part of that, what happened to their records, and to make sure those records were preserved, and um, they went through some disaster recovery pieces. Um, we all probably, you all are well aware of Katrina that hit in 2005, thus my comment yesterday about disaster. One of the other things I do for the International Council of Archives is I now chair their expert group on emergency management and disaster preparedness. So I am well um, versed, not, you know, baptism by water, um, and lots of it. Um, I became not because I wanted to, I guess God put me in that position, to become somebody that knew how to handle disasters. I didn't know I knew how to handle that, but I've now broadened my scope of being able to teach all over, um, and I'll be in the Caribbean um, in two weeks to teach there about what needs to happen um, moving forward during hurricane season. So we learned a lot during Hurricane Katrina. We've also helped the Sisters of the Holy Family with the Henriette de Lille Historical Commission, again, after um, Hurricane Katrina, because most of their stuff was flooded, and we were in the middle of a cause for canonization for their founders. And then we've also worked with um, St. Joseph, the community of Madai in Baton Rouge, because they also had the same problem of having to move all of their records and things had gotten wet, and they came to Baton Rouge to be um, in, at that diocese. Um, the other things that we've done, we've helped the Redemptors when they moved their archives in 2003. The story that is most critical for us that really shines a light is the Sisters of the Immaculate Conception that were down in Bayou Lafouche. We got a phone call years ago that said, we've thrown all the big stuff away, we have two little boxes, come get it. Which was terrible. But the community was being closed, they were down to three sisters, they were told, go find some place to live. Um, and we know this is becoming more and more something that happens. So we need to make sure that as the archivist in the diocese is that that does not happen to those community records. Whoops, didn't realize that was there. Good. Um, we, for the Archdiocese in New Orleans, these are the things that we look at. We look at the importance of the congregation and their contribution. This is what helps us make decisions. Their contribution to the history of the city, 
their ministry, whether they had hospitals, infant homes, dairy farms, etc., cetera, um, education, schools, all the different ministries that we see the communities doing. The education of young people, the evangelization in the community, and its role within the archdiocese. Um, the Ursulines have had an intricate role. They've been there. I mean, the city started in 1718. We're having our tricentennial. And the sisters got there in 1727. Um, and all the other orders followed after that, including the Jesuits. We welcome them. Um, <laughs> I say that as an Ursuline graduate, but the Ursulines usually say that as well. <laughs> So the other thing we want to do is we want to be able to document who the sisters and brothers were, um, how they were part of the local people, and how they joined, those local people joined the order, their service in the field of ministry, and sometimes we do that through um, our exhibits, and this is actually a picture of one of, from one of our exhibits. They're remembered by many. Um, that was talked about yesterday when we talked about stakeholders. Those are the people that really have an ownership in who the sisters were that helped educate them, that ministered them in hospitals, etc. We want to be able to capture the charism and we want to be able to celebrate their contribution at, in the local church. Um, this picture is from the Sisters of the Holy Family and it was when they were landing in Belize to, do, to start their mission work there. The role of the archivist. In 1908, this is the archivist for the Archdiocese of New Orleans. There's a lovely description that is in a book about the archives and about the um, cathedral and the cathedral archives. And part of it is among the dusty, old, beautiful tomes rest an old gentleman that is the caregiver. And he's a very quiet, unassuming man. And when he dies, another caretaker takes his place. And it goes on and on about these dusty tomes, typical 1900s writings about the romance of these records. Well. In 2005, when they hired me, it all changed. <laughs> so the role of the archivist is to be a colleague, a consultant, an advocate, a mentor, a specialist, an advisor, sometimes a broker. Sometimes you want them, if something is being sold, you want to be able to have them there to um, advocate for you, to help you make those decisions, and then as a friend. I've been a friend to many of the communities and I've sat in many of their meetings as they're trying to make decisions of what is the best thing for their archives. So we are very active in attending those meetings and saying, what do you need us for and how can we help? Um, we are, as I said, invited to local meetings. We like to visit the congregation archives. Sometimes, could you just come see how we just redid our shelving? Or hopefully, we're getting ready to redo our shelving. Will you come see what we're thinking about? Providing advice for best practices and standards. If they can't afford boxes, we'll help them with some archival boxes and materials. Educating through workshops and seminars, we always make sure that if we're doing anything, we invite the community leaders and the archivist. We advocate for that professional training, either through some of our programs or by having them attend Greater New Orleans Archivist or any of the other programs that are happening. Um, we listen to their needs and concerns, and we provide sound advice, taking into consideration all the factors without emotional ties. I try to look at it professionally. I know how tied we all are to our material, but I do try to help give some clear advice. I would love for it to all come to the archdiocese. Sometimes the community leaders don't want it coming to us. So my best role then is to help advocate to them what then are their options and how can I help facilitate that, even if we aren't going to be the one, the chosen one. So the options for the, con for the collection, I ask these questions. Does the congregation want to leave a legacy of their work in the city archives, or do they want to transfer it to the mother house? 
How integral is the work they... Uh, there's a word in there that's missing, huh? Is it a part of the archdiocesan history? How long have they been in the archdiocese? Does it make sense to move the collection to the, to the mother house in the instance of some things that are at the Ursulines? For it to go, because they've been in New Orleans almost 300 years, things going to the mother house in um, St. Louis may not make sense because it would be more difficult to be able to do some of that research. And then what would the availability to fut future researchers be? So we look at all of these questions. The options. There's an outright donation. There's a permanent loan. And we'll talk about permanent loans in the way that we look at permanent loans because I don't like permanent loans. Um, the long-term care agreement with transfer of ownership, which is what you have a sample copy of. The sale of the collection. I've seen this happen for objects because um, sometimes as an order is closing, even if it's the beds, you know, the desks, the tables, they'll have a, they'll have a fire sale to be, to be able to generate money for the community. And then if they decide to break it up, some go here, some go there, some go back to the mother house. What does that look like? And how is an archivist, because it's against all of our practices to make, break up a collection, if it does make sense to break it up, how do we document that so that in each place that gets a piece of the collection, someone would know what's where? This is the Ursulines when they moved um, in 1912 to their current place, they had to board an electric car, is what it was called at the time. There were shades on the window because they were still cloistered and they were transferred across town. Some of them had never left the community they were in before, and so it was 50 years that they had been outside of the community. And now, because they had entered in the 1850s and 60s, they were getting on an electric car. It's pretty interesting. So again, um, the donations can happen that it could go to an archdiocese, a Catholic university, a community or state university, hospital archives, city or state library, or private repository. Those are just some of the options. The permanent loan. Is there a caveat or a clause for transfer of the ownership after a certain period of time? That's really key and really important. What are the research restrictions? Is it closed or certain parts of it closed for a certain amount of time? Who is the contract person for the copyright? Does the material still rest the copyright with the community or is the copyright being transferred to the repository receiving the material? What controls are you putting on the contract and is there a better solution? The long-term care and trust agreement that we're gonna talk about um, came about because often when a priest dies, his chalice, the family isn't quite ready to give it to the archdiocese, but they don't, you know, kind of can't sit on the mantle in the house and be used during Thanksgiving dinner with the fruit coming out of it. Um, so <laughs> they say, what do we do with this? But we, somebody in the family might become a priest, but we don't know. And so we then offer them a trust and care agreement that the chalice comes to us for a period of anywhere from five years to 25 years. If someone in the family becomes a priest, if they want to take the chalice for family occasions, that can happen. At the end of the time period, the ownership then reverts to the archdiocese to be able to use the chalice as it sees fit. Um, the reason why we do this is so that 75 years from now, when there's another archivist in place. She doesn't have to figure out the genealogy of the great-great-nephew, first time removed, three times over, that says, I was related to that priest. Can I have that gold entrusted jeweled chalice? Okay? So there's a protection part of it. We're caring for it, then it's going to revert to us. So there's the responsibility of the archives to care for the collection, the ability for researchers to access the material, that which is deemed open, and accessible. The ownership is transferred after a specific period of time. The agreement can be amended and reviewed on a specific basis, whether it's every five years, 10 years, etc. If the congregation leaves the city and no action is taken for a period of years, then the ownership transfers. We put that into the agreement. So 
if the community is totally gone, and there's nobody, what happens if there's nobody there to make the, the you know, and you've, you're, you're, you're at a 15 year agreement, you're at year 12 and the last nun dies and uh, now what? So we have that caveat in there that if there's no one to make the decision to continue that contract, then the ownership reverts. And then there's other options, of course, that can be explored. If you decide to sell the co collection, these are some pros and cons. Um, sometimes the reason is to raise funds for the congregation, but there is no say on how the collection will be managed. Once you sell it to a private entity, even if it's a private historic collection, you lose your rights to say, I want it to be maintained like this. The collection can be broken into pieces and resold, and we've all seen those eBay nightmares. We've had to go and purchase things back um, for the archdiocese because they ended up on eBay. Um, there are some positives as far as the sale of the rare book collection. I've seen the library be sold to a historic collection because it was going to be able to be used, and it raised funds for the community. There's the sale of the museum quality items. We've actually um, we purchased from one of the religious communities a set of silver candlesticks because it was part of a dowry. They were trying to raise money. We agreed to purchase it if it was going towards that, what they needed. So um, we were able to purchase those. And then, of course, the art and the furniture. If you break up the collection, different repositories are given or sold different parts of the collection. That can be really tricky, and I do not advise that. Um, but some things may go to the mother house, the house chronicles, the annals, the personnel files. Um, for us, the archdiocesan archives, they may get the historic manuscripts and the photographs because the mother house is not interested in having those. A museum may end up with the fine art, the china, the antique furniture. And then in private hands, sometimes there's sales with the auctions, etc., as we've seen the property be broken up. You do need to weigh all the options carefully. You need to partner if you can. If you have a professional diocesan archivist in your area, partnering with them to get some advice. Ask lots of questions. No questions are, are not good questions. And then make the best possible decisions for your collections. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is the Sisters of the Holy Family. They were the first to start elderly care. Um, and this is from about 1890, where they were caring for the indigent and some of the elderly. And that's me. Um, I, I'm going to look at the time real quick. I'm going to take two minutes. The paper that you have in front of us, in front of you, is the Sample Trust and Care Agreement. This is an agreement that we've used. I went through it, cleaned out our language, um, you know, the markers of who we were dealing with, et cetera. Passed it back through our general counsel. She said, yes, it's clean um, for us to be able to share it with you. Uh, I will quickly sort of, you can break down the parts. The beginning of it really does talk about, for us, it, it states our mission as, a, as an archdiocese. We want what the community's mission is. We want to be able to know when the community started, um, what, and what the agreement will be, so we want their charism as part of it as well, and then the, the, what they are going to place within us and why. There's an ownership and the loan period, um, and there's lots of legalese in here, so I certainly will be here throughout the rest of the morning. Um, if you get a chance to briefly look through it, or if you want later to email me and ask why is that phrase in there, it does get a little technical. Um, and then there are the duties of the archdiocese, or the, the diocese. What are we responsible for? How are we going to care for the collection? How is the public going to access the collection? What are the standards of care? What are we willing to put up as part of um, our commitment to that collection? What are the copying and sales of the community archives material? Not sales as in here by it, but if someone is doing a book and is going to make 
a large profit off of pictures. If we sell for the reproduction of a picture, who gets that money? The community in particular we were working with said, you all keep it, you're managing all that collection, you can get the $5 on the reprint of the photograph. Then there's loans of the community archives material. So say someone wanted to do uh, a museum exhibit, an outside person, what would that loan look like? So now it's a loan to a loan to a loan. Um, and so there, there's some communication in there, there's some language in, them, in there of how that would then not necessarily be from us, but be from the community, but we would all be talking about how that would work together. Um, and then the lenders' names, and then usually following this document is, um, and you'll see condition, et cetera, what, what, how we're going to do this. There's a full summary and breakdown, sometimes by each document, what is coming to us. So it's not just a finding aid, it's a complete list of everything that we're getting so that we can manage that. Okay? So use it as well, pilfer. Uh, you know, I'm a great uh, believer in see one, do one, teach one, as well as um, no reason to reinvent the wheel. So feel free to use those as you, as you see fit. Okay? Good morning, happy Friday. So good morning, my name is Kat Osterheis, and thanks to Ellen for uh, even being willing to say my last name. Um, I had a boss at U.S. Bank who I worked for for almost 10 years, and she the entire time wouldn't even bother to try. She would introduce me and she would say, this is Catherine. Catherine, say your last name. <laughs> so, uh, in lieu of time, I'm going to try and condense uh, our conversation a little bit today, so bear with me as, as I go through transition. Um, so, as I was introduced, I am the Institute Archivist for the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, and I am the director of their Centralized Archives uh, Mercy Heritage Center. We are this year celebrating 175 years being in the United States, which is very exciting, but don't get me started on that particular project. So the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas covers continent of the United States, covers um, Central and South America, also covers Jamaica, Guam, Philippines. So in trying to um, ensure that we are meeting the needs of all of our stakeholders, it can get a little complicated. So our official mission is to preserve and relate the story of the Institute of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas. Um, we endeavor to illustrate the vibrant and relative impact of the Sisters of Mercy on society and to inspire visitors to make a personal commitment to similar values. So that last piece, it makes it sound like we should also be considered a ministry, but we're not. So Mercy Heritage Center is located in Belmont, North Carolina. Um, it is a two-story building. Um, and we have a staff of three located there, as well as a slew of volunteers, um, both with, within the community and sort of locally. Um, interns, we, we, we've expanded our internship program, um, trying to get as many hands in the door as possible to help us with our expanding um, responsibilities. So in terms of collections, we have over 5,300 of linear feet of just archival material. Um, we have over 60 different collections, and those contain everything from government entities, um, individual communities, former local communities, individual sister collections, which is something that we haven't gotten into um, historically, um, and then also some select ministries. So it really runs the gamut there. We also have over 3,000 artifacts. Um, and then we also have to make sure that I represent uh, 
Emily's role. Emily, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have over 150 film reels. We have over 100,000 um, photographs, audio reels, over 5,000 audio cassettes, VHS, and then we have over uh, 6,000 library books. And it continues to grow every day. Um, we joke about sort of drive-bys. Um, every single day we get either something in the mail as a donation. Um, we'll have a car roll up and a sister come out from Kentucky saying, I've got a, I've got a trunk load full of stuff. Um, or we'll have the maintenance people show up with boxes that were delivered in the mail. So it's, it's, it's a very exciting time for us. But just to give you a little bit of understanding of sort of the governance structure and how archives has, has been impacted by that. So in 1991, they formed um, the Institute, which is kind of the overall umbrella arching over all of the different communities. And about that time, they started to think about truly sort of long term, as many other congregations and um, religious communities are, you know, um, the membership is dwindling. Um, the organizational structure around the community needs to grow. So what does that look like? And, and resulting from that, you know, what do we want our legacy to be? And archives, of course, is a huge part, part of that. So um, from that came, in the mid-2000s, sort of a, a consolidation of different 25 um, different local communities. So these 25 communities formed six regional communities. And the only way we distinguish that in our organization as we talk is big C and little c, which can completely complicate things. Um, but again, talking about sort of language and how important language is, um, that's what we've gone with. So we've got six different regional communities. So we had um, Typically, it was a sister archivist in each of these different 25 local communities. And with the formation of these six regions, then they started to take a look at, OK, well, what are we going to do in terms of archives going forward? You know, do we have a sister that can take on that role? Or do we need to, to look outside the organization and get some, prof some professional, um, professional staff with true archival experience in here? And so with these six regions, we've got sort of a combination um, of those things. We've got, we had two sister archivists as well as four professional archivists. So with all of this change in the governance, it really comes down to how do we tell that story? How do we tell the comprehensive story of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas? Well, at Mercy Heritage Center, as I said, we've got a staff of three. Um, as of July 1st, we just added another um, remote staff person, and he's located in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, so it takes, it truly does take a community to do what we do. So it starts with the leadership teams. We have strong support from leadership, um, at least at the institute level. The community level, it's hit or miss. Um, so then we've got, so we've got the leadership team, which is primary. Then we've got um, the former community archivists who are still out there in the communities, some doing work, some not, some retired. Um, we've got the community archivists that were hired for each of the different regions. Um, of course, then we've got the community members. Um, we've got consultants that we occasionally bring in. Um, and then again, sort of our volunteers and our interns, and then also the international mercy community. So with um, the congregations located elsewhere in the world, we do have kind of a informal relationship with them, and, and that is something that we've been tasked with building upon. So with all of these changes, um, it was determined that we needed to figure out, again, what to do next with the archives. So the 25 former regional community archivists formed a group um, and over a course of about seven, eight years, put together a recommendation for leadership. And that was that it was time to go ahead and centralize the archives, have one place for it um, to create greater efficiencies. But in doing so, how does that impact how the sisters lived with their heritage at the local level? So there were still a lot of concerns about how this was all going to work um, and how we were going to be able to meet the needs from, wait a minute, where are we located? Why is it going to be in Belmont? Um, there's, there's still even a lot of that today that we have to deal with. So, 
So we went from, just to, to kind of look at the numbers, we went from 25 archivists to six regional community archivists, and at the time, one staff person at Mercy Heritage Center. And now today, we're at four institute staff people um, and 3.5 community archivist staff. And as I've mentioned, our role has gone from you know, taking care of sort of the paper materials, and it has grown exponentially in terms of what the community is expecting us to do. So it's been a whirlwind of activity. So with the discussion of merging all of the archives, um, the, the overall sort of goals were for the collections to be properly cared for. Not every local community had the resources um, or the opportunity to really be able to care for them and have them in an environmentally controlled facility or have someone that, that was professionally trained to be able to care for them if even that was available. Cost effectiveness. As we know, archives is an expensive business, um, and we don't do a lot in terms of generating revenue. So how do we be able to do more um, while saving more money? Staffing. Um, as we know, uh, in the majority of religious communities, the average age, at least for Sisters of Mercy, is 77 years old. So as they start to age out, there are less um, available uh, less available staff to be able to do that sort of thing. And so how do we transition from sisters caring for collections to lay people caring for the collections? And what does that do to the culture? And that's definitely been a huge learning opportunity for us. Technology. Again, the average sister who wasn't professionally trained isn't comfortable with technology. And I, and I make that blanket statement, knowing that there are individuals who are more technologically savvy. But, but how do you build technology into this to, again, make sure that you're creating greater efficiencies, um, broadening your access? But how do you do that if someone isn't trained to do that? And then again, the sharing of the story. As the um, personal impact of the sisters dwindles, because they are less and less in the ministries that they have created, how do we make sure that, that um, the story of mercy continues? So those would be the benefits of consolidating. The concerns, again, are sort of losing um, access to that local material and, and getting that local story. Um, and then sort of how um, do archives, how does that impact sort of um, identity in the time of all of this upheaval and change within the community? So in terms of a site, I think I, I made a little joke earlier about Belmont, North Carolina, and where is that? Um, there was lots of talk, lots of considerations about where we should be located. Should we be located in um, Pittsburgh, which was where we started? You know, should we be located out in California? W what makes sense? Um, and the criteria really came down to just a couple of different things. So um, we wanted a freestanding building. It needed to be Mercy-owned. Um, and it needed to be easily accessible. So it needed to be close to an airport where people could come in, do research, um, and preferably also on an existing com community. So we are actually located in um, the campus of one of the um, regional community administration centers. So we are very fortunate in that um, with this campus, we've got the administration cent uh, center for South Central Community, and then we have individual ministries and then we have a convent, of course, where the sisters are located. So we're kind of smack in the middle of all of the work that's being done. Um, and so that's truly a blessing for us. So as you can imagine, nothing ever goes quickly when you're dealing with a women's religious community. Um, and it took several years to get to this point. So it took about seven years to actually sort of figure out the criteria, figure out who was going to help make the decision, get leadership's buy-in. Um, and so about 2008, they finally came to the conclusion that, okay, it makes sense to do it at Belmont. And of course, talking again about resources, ultimately what the decision was based on was the fact that the, South, the newly formed South Central community was willing to foot the bill for the cost of the renovations of the building. <laughs> So it was actually um, a former campus library. So it was already sort of you know, in the arena um, for it to work for archives. So they took about two years to renovate it. 
Um, and then they hired their first person, my predecessor, Grant Gerlich, which many of you may know, um, in 2010. So in preparations, again, each of the local community archivists had about two years to put their collections in order. Um, and with the transition, collections started to come in around 2011. It took about till 2014 for all of the 25 collections to kind of finally walk through the door. We had um, a collection as small as a car trunk full, and we had a collection as large as uh, needing a semi-truck to unload it all. And one of the blessings of this process was that each of the former community archivists were able to come to Belmont with their collection to be able to have that passing off. Um, there was a lot of struggle um, with that piece of the letting go of the collections. Um, The sisters were very, very supportive of the idea of a centralized archives, but it's very different to say in theory, this is what we want to have happen and we know that needs to happen and it's a whole nother thing for the heart to let it all go. So it was a long process. We have a, an urban legend in our, in our organization that some of the sisters showed up wearing black armbands. <laughs> and there's, there's this thought that, you know, that there were some that it was truly a struggle for. And, and we're, dealing, we're still dealing with the impact of all of that today. So one of the most difficult conversations was, so now that we've made this decision that it needs to go to Belmont, what should come to Belmont? What stays at the local level and what gets sent to the centralized archives? And while there was criteria sort of sent out, everybody sort of interpreted that a little bit differently. So even today, um, 10 years later, there are still bastions of those collections still located at the local level. And so um, it's, I always tell the story to my staff when I come back from traveling these local sites that um, all of the sisters, they see me and they know who I am. They know I'm Institute and they know that I'm from Mercy Heritage Center and they sort of scurry out of the way. They don't want to catch my eye, you know. I've actually had sisters come up to me and say, please don't take our stuff. Please don't take our stuff, you know. And so it's been a lot of sort of education again and advocacy for Mercy Heritage Center to let them know that, no, I'm not going to rip things out of your hands. I don't want to do that, you know. Let's keep them where they are. You know, if it's, if it's at the point where the community is still living their history and it's important to you, then you keep it there. But let's set up some parameters and some guidelines for what that looks like so that A, it doesn't walk out the door, and B, it's cared for properly. And at some point when you are ready to let it go, then yes, we welcome it at Mercy Heritage Center with open arms. But that's a conversation that I almost have to have on the individual basis because there is this fear of, you know, I am the face of the Institute. So, so again, that's something that we're working with every single day. So, but as an aside, I have to tell you that we still have one collection. So again, we're talking 10 years later. We still have one collection that has not been officially given to us. And it's actually the local collection of where we're located in Belmont, North Carolina. <laughs> so it's physically located in the Heritage Center, but the former community archivist is still working on the collection. <laughs> so again, it's one of those things where you have to sort of pick and choose your battles and um, remember that at the end of the day, we are stewards of the collections and, and, and be mindful of compassion. Change is hard for everybody, and it's even harder when your whole world is changing. Um, and so that's one of the lessons that, that I especially, coming to Mercy Heritage Center, has tried to instill, is this idea that, you know, um, we're not ogres, we're not trying to rip things from people's hands, and it's, it's, it's all a matter of working together for the common good. Okay, here we go. 
Um, one of the biggest aha moments that we had, and hopefully anybody that's interested in consolidating um, their collections, I'm more than willing to have a, a separate conversation about, but one of the things that we weren't um, anticipating is this idea that, again, you've got people who are not professionally trained, or, or to some level professionally trained, um, and so you've got 25 different archivists bringing 25 different collections, and, and there was this misperception that we could just put those collections on the shelf and boom, we're ready to go. That nothing else would need to be done with them. And we're still working on those collections again today, 10 years later, um, you know, getting some sort of um, standardization done, some sort of structure around them. Um, and so it is still sort of an awkward process, um, but, but again, we're working through it. But that was one of the things that, that nobody necessarily anticipated um, working through this process. So once the collections arrived, and we had that big aha moment, it's like, okay, let's, let's start to work through those collections, but what else do we need to do? Well, we need to create policies and procedures around how those collections are being used. Um, again, the assessment piece of it was so very important. And then how do we provide access and reference? And I have to say that the team um, um, historically has done an amazing job of making sure that the sisters feel like, even though their stuff is located in, in crazy, you know, North Carolina, um, that they still feel as connected to their collections as what they did when they were located locally. Um, and then also in terms of access, again, you know, broadening the story of making sure that we're as comprehensive as possible, you know, how do we continue to use technology to make it more available? And that's something that we continue to work on today. So, um, recently, um, with me coming on board, one of the things that we did is a strategic plan, a five-year strategic plan. So what does Mercy Heritage Center look like in the next five years? What do we need to do? And it's been a very exciting time because leadership is very supportive of our role and want us to be even more embedded in, across the institution. But how do we do that with dwindling resources? So we've been trying to anticipate ways of doing that. How do we uncover collections that we've never um, promoted before? For instance, our library collection. Nobody knows that we have this collection, but it's, it's rather unique. So how do we make that accessible? Um, how do we ensure that the history that's being created today is being saved? So we develop a records management program. So we're being tasked with doing all of these things, broadening our collection scope, um, you know, really trying to um, be of support not only to the community members, but also the organization, the staff, the administration that's being wrapped around it, as well as then individual ministries outside of that world. So as our sphere of influence is being asked to be bigger, how do we manage to do that? And so that's something that we continue to work on. But, but the importance for us is sort of the balance between sort of, again, professional standards and compassion. How do we make sure that we do what we need to get done while still being sympathetic to the needs of the community? So for us, it just goes back to the basics. So continue to focus on the main task of serving our members, serving our, um, the different um, stakeholders, telling the story, preserving the institutional memory, and again, providing greater access and getting the story out there. So um, ultimately, the bottom line is, as the organization evolves, how does the archives evolve to make sure that we're mirroring that and can tell that continuing story? And with that, I'm going to be done. Some of you raised a question about how you would get to Logan. Thank you for doing that. That can be very complicated. Starting at 1230, there will be shuttle buses in front of St. Ignatius Church that will take you to Logan. You do not have to be there at 1230. The buses will probably run until a little after 1. 
but that's when they will arrive and they will motor you directly to Logan. So you made other arrangements, which I did make with some. You can cancel those. The buses will be a much better deal. All right? That's Michael Burns, who, like me, is one of the members of the advisory committee and one of the members of the local planning committee that resulted in this. And uh, an hour ago, we didn't have the buses, and Michael got into it, and now we have the buses. Isn't that amazing? I'm from the Northeast, and we talk faster than people from other areas of the country, so maybe I can get my whole speech in the time left for the session. But I'm not going to try to do it. I agree with everything that Lee and Kat said. That's 90% of my speech right there. <laughs> the word caveat has been used by various speakers. Uh, Jim O'Toole was talking about caveats yesterday. Uh, literally, if we have the phrase, as you know, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. I like to think of caveat as let's be aware. And I'm going to mention some things uh, that you should be aware of. For example, in all these transactions and these plans, be very aware of copyright. When you, when you get to the point where you and people in your community are transferring under whatever agreement your archives to another institution, they will ask you to transfer the copyright. And you might very well say, of course, I'll sign away, here's the copyright. Your community does not have the copyright to everything in your archives. Nobody does. Things created, yes. Things received, no. Those go to other creators. So really keep that in mind. Ownership. Yeah, I'll sign off. Here it is. Review your collections very carefully. We often have physical uh, custody of materials that we do not legally own. Now sometimes people have given us things and signed a deed of gift, but they didn't own everything in the collection. It turns out they got it from somebody who didn't legally give it to them. Nightmare, yes, but it's another thing we have to think about. I think of this very often in terms of surveys. We are always surveying our collections in many different ways, sometimes in a very planned, careful way, and sometimes last minute when the boss is coming and wants to look at such and such, and we gotta run around and find everything that he or she wants. Uh, we survey constantly in terms of preservation. We survey in terms of accessibility. We survey in terms of sensitivity and privacy. Uh, we, sur we survey our finding aids. Do these really reflect uh, the new interests that people have, the very pressing interests that people have in our collections? Also survey in terms of copyright and survey in terms of ownership. When you, let us say, I'm particularly talking today about donation to uh, a college or university. We're particularly thinking of Catholic college or university. Uh, when you are giving them materials, you are going to have a negotiation, um, uh, a, a conference uh, long before uh, the actual transfer is made if you decide to make that transfer. And that, the people in the archives will want to know what the status is of ownership and the status is of uh, of, the, uh, of the copyright of the materials, separate from the physical ownership of them. So you want to be aware of that. I, I have a list of this, and it, it supplements in some way what Lee and Kat have said, and I have a stack of these outlines on the table. If you go out, you can get one. If you think of what they have said and the things I've added to it and what you've heard Wednesday night and yesterday, we have a very long list, don't we, of things that we must think about, take into consideration, provide for. So uh, whatever we decide to do with our collections, we certainly want to do all these other things. Um, 
we're aware, particularly now, where we, as been mentioned, we have fewer people working, we have fewer resources in many ways, and yet we have to uh, carefully and thoroughly review these things. Uh, so the thing to do it is ver to do it. Uh, the thing to do is to be very systematic about it. Uh, where are we going from here is the question that a lot of people have asked over the last few days in the small group discussions and, and elsewhere. And um, uh, w w we know where we would like to go. We would like to go with you on the journey to provide uh, long term for the preservation of the heritage and the continua continuation of the charism of uh, all these communities and other communities. And because of your input, we're going to be able to do that. Before you came here, all of you answered questions, a survey, application form, and you, I hope, have heard your interests, your questions, your statement of challenges reflected in what the speakers have spoken about during these sessions, because we, we did a lot of work, and people other than I, people like Maliki and Christian and Ellen and all the other, Lee and all the other members of the advisory committee worked very hard to bring this together. I think they've done a very good job. We might even have a motto in mind while we go forth from here, and why not use the one that's been on the screen for the last few days, and I'm sure some people have puzzled about it. I assume you all know Latin, so the banner for religion and the good arts is clear enough to you, but you might not be familiar with the Greek, and I'm not sure of my pronunciation. It's something like Ion Aristion. Sounds like aristocracy, uh, that kind of thing. And it is unusually for a Catholic college, a quotation from Homer's Iliad. Most of our Catholic college mottos and things on our seals are from the Bible or from something a founder said or aware of that. This is uh, 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 one, one of the Greek warriors challenged a warrior on the opposite side. It was not a Trojan, but one of the allies of the Trojan, because this warrior, agent, they don't fight just anybody. They, they, they've got to have a worthy opponent out there to fight. Who are you? And he said, I am so-and-so, I am from this city, I am from this family, and I have been told ever to excel ever to excel. That's why the word excellence has been looking at us and we've been looking at it all this week. You think it's accidental that we had the word excellence during the whole conference, uh, but it, it does fit in very nicely. So uh, there's, there's a lot coming, the lightning rounds coming up and things like that. Uh, coffee break first and people are around to answer questions. So I hope you've enjoyed the session. We can tell we've all enjoyed sharing all of these things with you. Thank you.